The 2016 election offered a perfect opportunity to see how the voter suppression playbook was working in real time. The first stop, North Carolina. My name is uh, Michael Evan Hires. I'm a 100% disabled veteran. I'm not married. I have the time, I have the skills, and have a desire to make sure that every American vote is legally cast. The Voting Integrity Project is interesting. They've always had a bit of a gadfly, renegade, vigilante voter, fraud, you know, crusaders. They claimed that thousands of non-citizens were voting in the state where they would challenge voters at county boards of elections, and then they couldn't prove that really any of those were true. Is there anyone in the audience today who received a notice that if they wish their name not to be removed from the voter rolls, they should be present. Stand up then and give us your name, please. Randy Burkett. Jamie. Okay, okay. sir. John McKee. Well, North Carolina has a provision where a citizen can challenge the right of another citizen to vote. It's been on the books forever. Who else is going to know who's registered to vote unless another citizen does it? Some of the laws that wind up being discriminatory today had discriminatory intent when they were first written in the early 1900s as part of the Jim Crow laws. For example, voter purging laws to cleanse the rolls. And this was typically used in the Jim Crow area by whites who were trying to prevent newly enfranchised African-Americans from having access to the ballot box. Michael's methodology involves finding voters that the state identified as inactive. These people have missed two federal elections, so they were listed as inactive. And I started sending letters to these inactive voters on the Cumberland County voter rolls. The ones that came back marked by the post office as undeliverable are considered evidence that the voter no longer resides at that address. And Mike challenged those voters. Voter challenge envelopes were marked do not forward. If a resident moves in the district, even across the street, he or she will not receive the notice their registration is being challenged, or even know to come to the Board of Elections hearing to contest the challenge. What the letter essentially says to Purim to maintain my voter registration uh, as it is currently today. Whoever this guy is has challenged my right to vote. But the only way to defend your registration was to go in person. The process heavily favors the person doing the challenging. Not everybody is going to get a letter or have the time to defend it. What do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? My primary place of residence is the address on my voter registration. Yeah, I'd like to motion that the challenge to Ms. Burkett be dismissed. Second. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 The challenge against you is dismissed. Voter registration remains. Now let's move on to Mr. John Lamont McKeithen, Jr. Some people have the knack of spotting anomalies. It's kind of like seeing a lump of coal in a bale of cotton. It, it'll just pop right out at you. So let me just ask you, what do you want this board to know concerning your place of residence? Uh, I do live and have lived at 7790 Stony Point Road. It's at 7790. Mm -hmm. okay, this is 7770. Is there a possibility that people got struck from the rolls mistakenly because the post office did not appropriately deliver the mail? Still, there is a small, small possibility on that. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give concerning this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God? I do. All the evidence shows that when someone is purged from the rolls, it's extremely unlikely that they're going to re-register. It's hard to get them to re-register. And I worry that it will diminish the will to participate in the political process. And the danger is if states use unreliable information to take voters off the rolls, and if they do not give voters adequate notice and an opportunity to contest their removal, then we could have a situation where hundreds or even thousands of legitimate voters are being taken off of the rolls without their knowledge. I love the vote. It was instilled in us to vote. 
My grandma raised me up and my sister up to vote. You know, when we turned 18, that was all right. <laughs> Um, the address when I registered was 766 to Bridge with Service. Okay. I'm going to have to have you go and stand in that line so they can update you. Okay. All right. Next voter, please. Hello. Michael Evan Hires. There you go. Thank you very much. I need a picture of you. I got an old one. Let's see what you have. Karen, is this your address? No, ma'am. You're not doing a video. You got to sing with me. She told me I could not vote at all. Because I got to re-register because I'm, I'm nowhere in the system. They're not making it easy at all. It's, it's tiresome. Yeah. Yep, we got to clean the rolls up one way or another. I happened to stumble across the Phantom Voter Project. I started looking at my neighborhood and started finding what I believe to be a bunch of fraudulent registrations and started investigating them. It's about time we turned the lights on in the kitchen and started cleaning the cockroaches out of here. When I found out um, that I was purged off the rolls, and I was highly upset about it. Because, I, like I said, I mean, I grew up seeing my family vote. I know it's my God-given right today to vote, and I want to vote. The voter suppression playbook is complete. It's part and parcel of the same malevolent and dark strategy. Cut a few voters here, a few voters there. Discourage others from even taking the time to cast a ballot. In short, undermine the sacred American principle of one person, one vote. So just to finish up, you see what's happening? The process is rigged. This whole election is being rigged. As Donald Trump has said so many times, the elections are rigged, but in a much different way than he claims. They're rigged to stem the rising demographic tide of non-white voters and to discourage younger voters. Clearly, the voter suppression playbook is working all too well. We need all of our institutions of power to protect the right to vote. We need the legislature to protect the right to vote, we need the executive to protect the right to vote, and we need the courts to protect the right to vote. The majority of Americans are very, very proud of our right to vote, and the majority of Americans are very uh, frustrated and disgusted when they see politicians tarnishing our right to vote. When you deprive people of the right to vote, the vote being the very fiber of this wonderful quilt we call democracy. When you begin to tear the threads away, saying this person can't vote, that person can't vote, that person can't vote, the next thing you know, you will not have a democracy. I think our founding fathers were brilliant, and I think they put in guardrails of democracy to keep the crazy out. Now, I think we're being sorely tested, and we're gonna see how strong those guardrails are. Uh, because they've never been tested like this. But that's the nature of democracy, that it does not, it's not static. It doesn't just stay free and open because it's a democracy. It's because every day you fight to keep it open. Every day you, you, have, to, you have to put your shoulder to it and demand that it live up to its ideals and its promises. People don't understand why it's so important that this experiment we call the United States continues. Then you say, well, it, it's, it's always been this way in my life, so I'm sure America's gonna continue the same way. Well, are you? And until we can say, without doubt, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, until that means exactly what it says, we are still working toward becoming a more perfect union.